We want to explain to all of you who are, are sort of right with us in this key moment uh, more about the after party, but just a word about the very title, the after party. This is a title that has a lot of different meanings. It has some theological meanings that we're going to unpack throughout this whole experience. But in the cultural context, what the after party refers to is, say, you'll have this big, flashy public event, like, say, the Emmys that just happened. People realize is that's the big flashy event. That's what people are all paying attention to. It's after that event is over. That's when the celebrities go to their own private after party. And that's when they relax, they, their hair comes down, they're off camera, and they can really gather around and have actual meaningful conversations where they're really themselves. That's what we envision for the after party. In this political season, there will be big flashy public events, which gets all the cameras like like the primary that just happened in Iowa. We think where the real meaningful conversations are going to happen are when Christians gather together and really gather together to have meaningful conversations centered on Jesus. And that's what the After Party Project is really trying to help us achieve. And a key person that's that's been crucial for us has been my uh, co-host here, Russell Moore. Um, Russell is the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, and when David and I, when we 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 had the idea first to start the after party, but we knew there was one person we had to get, and that was Russell. And I remember when David told me that Russell signed aboard, we just sort of like we did it like yes, it's it's going to happen. So Russell, um, tell us, you know what what has it been like for you to work on this uh, this project? Because uh, I from from my vantage point, it's been so fun to get to know you uh, doing this. Well, I was telling somebody the other day, our original title, you remember, was the Postpartisan Church. <laughs> and I said, that's because Curtis and David and I are nerds. We're nerds. We, we right. needed uh, Nancy French, David's wife, who said, no, the after party. And she was she was really on to something. Well, one of the fun things about the after party that we really like is that we are trying to give people a way to locate themselves in politics, other than this, the boring, standard, divisive categories of right versus left, Republican versus Democrat. And we really wanted to help people locate themselves really by their spiritual posture. And we came up with these categories of the combatant, the exhausted, and the cynic. So the combatant, and one of the fun things about these categories is we realized among the three of us that we actually played, like in real life, we occupied one of these roles. So David French, Maybe not surprised to folks who know him. He was the combatant. I am the cynic, even though Russell didn't believe me at first. I really am the cynic. I still don't believe you, but okay. <laughs> no, no. all right. <laughs> um, but Russell, Russell was the exhausted, and we wanted to open this uh, webinar by sharing with you uh, a, a segment from the actual course, the after party, where Russell explains his identity as the exhausted. So let's play that clip now. I find myself when I'm talking to someone who's been around for a long time or someone who's an expert in some area of history or sociology, I'll find myself asking, have things always been this crazy? Is this just life and I'm just noticing it? Or are we in a, a really unique time? And so far, to the person, uh, they have said, this is a unique time. There's something very different about this moment that we're in right now. The exhausted person um, often starts to wonder, am I the one who is uh, out of step and out of touch because I can't see what a lot of people around me seem to see? Of the categories that we're dealing with in this time together, I most identify with the exhausted. And I think that's because I'm, in, I'm a disappointed idealist, a broken-hearted uh, idealist. And I think when that happens, there ultimately can be a sense of, uh, of being overwhelmed. A key reason why I think people move into the exhausted phase 
is that anyone can endure almost anything for a little while. So if, if someone thinks I'm pressing through this conflict or craziness or whatever is happening for a little while, they can do it. It's when a person starts to think, oh, this is now the new normal, uh, that a, a person can be overwhelmed by that. One of the reasons idealists are often brokenhearted is, first of all, because we, we live in a fallen world, and so everything is going to lead to brokenheartedness at some level or the other. But even beyond that, uh, there often comes the realization, not just that people don't live up to their ideals, but that they never really held them. You start to get to the point where you realize uh, maybe the ideals that we held together as a group were just about group belonging. They didn't actually transcend the group. So when the group moves to a different place, a different set of ideals uh, are then used. And a person can always find a reason to rationalize that. Our, our ideals have changed because the people we're opposing are so much worse, uh, or the situation we're dealing with is so much worse. But the, the ideals then start to become part of group identity rather than what the group is moving toward. So we're going to have a chance now, uh, how the rest of this uh, webinar is going to be uh, first, Russell and I are going to do, have a little bit of conversation to talk about what he just shared uh, on video about this posture of being exhausted and what we can do as Christians in response. So we're going to have a, about 20 minutes of conversation about that. And then the rest of the time, we want to interact with you. We want to hear your questions, answer your questions. So what you can do is in the Q&A section, if you look on the bottom of your screen, screen there's a Q&A little button there. You can put in your questions. They'll be collected and they'll get teed up for us to answer in the, the last half of this webinar. So please participate, please join in, share with us your questions. If you also want to be uh, talking and having this conversation online, you can use the hashtag, hashtag centered on Jesus, centered on Jesus, um, hashtag centered on Jesus. Um, but yeah, either on the Q&A um, or on online, please participate. And then on the Q&A section, if you are monitoring this and you see a question that you really like, you're like, oh yeah, I really want Curtis or I really want Russell to answer that. There's a way that you can upvote that question and that will even give us more of a signal. Hey, people want us to address this question. So please uh, remember to do that. Uh, even as we're talking, you can go ahead and do that. And also, if you just will also... Uh, as you are listening to us, you're like, hey, I want to find out a little more while you're listening to us. You can also just go to after-party.org and check out how the course is laid out. Um, and it's okay. You can do that while even while we're talking. So you can go to after-party.org. All right, Russell, let's talk. Um, you talked about being exhausted. And I think when you were describing that, I imagine there were people listening that were just nodding their heads in agreement, because that is the widest, most common profile statistically among everybody, among all Americans, but I think especially Christians. Why is it so important that we address this sense of exhaustion, like actually head on and not just like give into it? Because I think exhaustion can easily tip over into a kind of cynicism that's that's maybe the most dangerous kind. Um, because a person can get so exhausted that one thinks either, well, I just have to do whatever it takes to live in the society that I'm in and kind of Romans 12 conform to the pattern of the world around me, um, or I just give up and, and I start uh, getting into a point of despair, which, which then influences everything else in terms of the, the way that we have uh, faith, hope, and love. So the, the exhaustion here is not just about whatever's in the news. It, it's it's about instead our own hearts and minds and souls. Russell, you talked in the video about how it gets especially exhausting when you feel this, this sense of this political animosity is hitting us over and over and it won't end. And I think about 
us as individuals. I think a lot about it also as pastors. A lot of, we're, we have a lot of pastors, I think, who are on this webinar and what they've had to endure the last two election cycles, you know, 2016 and then 2020, I, was really hard on pastors as they had to deal with congregations that were increasingly divided. And then the thought of now 2024 having to go through that again, that's exhausting. What would you say to those pastor the pastors here for a moment? What is our answer to that sense of exhaustion? Because uh, that can be, like you said, be really, really draining. Well, and the interesting thing about it is it it doesn't really matter where on the political spectrum a pastor is yeah. uh, or uh, often where on the political spectrum a congregation uh, is. You, you will have the same sorts of um, conversations. I had a, a conversation just the other day with a very, very conservative Texas uh, evangelical pastor and then a progressive uh urban uh, pastor. And both were saying the same thing, which is I actually agree with most of the politics of the people in my congregation. But the problem is, if I don't make it central, uh, then it becomes an issue. Or if I don't make somebody's particular uh, issue central, then it becomes an issue. And they're, they're ground down uh, yeah. by that. And so that that uh, is happening all over the place. I was talking to a group of pastors one time. I, I'll probably never forget the conversation because a pastor in the room said, what do you think it is about 2021, the year 2021, that broke so many of us? And a pastor in the room said, I think it's because up until then, we thought we were pressing through something. So 2016 election is really divisive. Let's get to 2017. Uh, and then it's a COVID pandemic, uh, those sorts of questions, really, really divisive. Let's press through that, through the 2020 election, through, you know, you just keep going through uh, these things. And there came a point, and this pastor identified it with 2021, where people started to realize, wait, we're not waiting for something to end. This is what, this is what the world looks like right now. And that's, that's really a daunting, that's a daunting task. What I think it illustrates what happens when we misplace our hope. If our hope is in the election cycle, like just getting through it, then that is exhausting because that doesn't pay off. It doesn't actually bring the relief. And this is a big reason why in the after party, we are wanting to recenter on Jesus, to place our hopes, not in an election cycle or an election outcome, but on the eternal promises of Jesus that transcend the election cycle. And, and this is where the call to hope is so important for the exhausted. There's another call in addition to the call to hope, which is that we make in the after party, which is the call to humility. Russell, talk about why the pairing of these two, hope and well, along with humility, uh, is so important in this moment. Well, I think one part of it is uh, the ability to want to actually connect with people who are different. Um, and I, I think it's it's really difficult when we're in a time when um, it's really similar in some ways to the world that Jesus walked into, which is why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? We just redefine who the tax collectors and sinners are all the time. So why are you uh, engaging with or talking with this, this person with whom you disagree? Aren't you signaling that you've lost your ideals? And that's that's just not the case. Um, but also because we, we're able to hold a sense of I might be wrong on a, a lot of issues, which causes you to walk forward in a little bit different way. But also it causes you to give some grace to the, the people you're engaging with. Because, um, you know, we, we, we understand how it is that we, even when we want to persuade each other, we understand how that happens. And it doesn't happen by overpowering somebody. Yeah. And it seems like so much of the difficulty with people adopting a posture of humility in politics is they think, well, if I do that, I'll just lose. You know, I'll get run over. Uh, I need to maintain a position of strength. 
And yet the posture of a disciple isn't out to win. They're out to follow Jesus. They're out to become, out to become more like Jesus. And so this is why in the after party, we so much talk about, we want to be disciples. We don't, out of our various postures of being combatant, being cynical or being exhausted, all three of those postures, we're trying to become more like Jesus. We're trying to be disciples. But, but that phrase, being a disciple applied to the realm of politics, that may be uh, new or, or just, you know, a new thing for, for pastors to think that part of their um, job as disciple makers is to disciple people's politics, not in telling them whether to be, you know, Republican or Democrat, but in how they engage, whether they, to, to disciple them into hope and humility. Can you talk more about this blind spot we have of where we sort of carve out politics from the realm of discipleship, even as pastors, we're, we're tempted to do that. Well, I think it is it part of it is because initially people think, well, if if people are being discipled and in the realm of politics, that means they're being told what their politics uh, should should be. Yeah. And, and we've seen a lot of that um, uh, in the history of the church. But actually what we're doing is the same thing that we do with parenting, with technology, with work. We're asking, how does this realm of your life shape you? And how are you carrying the witness of Christ into that uh, very important area? And that's really not a new thing. If you think yeah. of when John the Baptist is preaching um, at the Jordan, there are tax collectors and uh, Roman soldiers who come up and say, okay, I repent. What do I do now? And what John does is not to give them a military policy or a tax policy. It's to say, don't defraud people, don't extort people, don't uh, threaten people. He's talking about how they live out a life in conformity uh, with Christ. And one of the problems is we, we tend to find these areas of our life that we think are somehow separated out from discipleship, and we can give ourselves over to to whatever in those areas, and that ends up changing us. And so when when a lot of people, for instance, will will say, how do we get through 2024 with all the division that we're we're having around us? Sometimes what they mean is, okay, what is a month by month blueprint to keep the division from happening around me? And I'll always say, I don't have that for you. What I can tell you is how you can be uh a different kind of Christian, and I can be a different kind of Christian in 2024, even when we can't do anything about um, what what does the rest of the church do, much less what does the rest of the world do. I want to remind everybody once again to submit your questions in the Q&A button uh, that's down there below. You can again upvote questions that you see there that you really want us to address, and that will increase the chances that we get to that uh, momentarily. We're just going to have a few more uh, minutes before we turn it over to the Q&A section. Um, I do know one of the common questions we do get about the after party is, are you saying that what Christians believe in politics substantively, like on the policy, doesn't matter? And our answer, uh, Russell, as you well know, is no, 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 we're not saying it doesn't matter. It's that we believe Christians today have sacrificed the how, the Jesus how of politics in order to try to win on the what. Can you describe more of this dynamic where we're just so tempted to like give up on basic teachings of Jesus, like the sermon in the Sermon on the Mount, in order to achieve political victory? Well, it's really interesting to me. I think about it all the time when... Uh, when Jesus is is talking to his disciples, he says, I'm I'm leaving you, I'm going away, but you will join me and you know the way. Mm -hmm. And Thomas says exactly what I would have been thinking, I'm sure, which is, wait, were we asleep or something when he got up and gave us the code of yeah. uh, where he's going or the map? And, and he says, Lord, we don't know the way. And Jesus's answer is, I am the way and the truth and the life. A pastor named uh, Eugene Peterson used to say often, you can't have the Jesus truth without the Jesus life, and you can't have the Jesus life without the Jesus way. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the way that as Christians we follow Christ isn't by saying uh, in any area, 
okay, what's the goal? And then whatever it takes to, to get there, even if that means that I, I change what it means to follow Christ in, in that direction. That's, that's not what Jesus is, is teaching. And that's why it was so countercultural because what everybody uh, wanted was, okay, tell us how to get the Romans out of here or, or tell us how to, um, to make sure the Roman empire succeeds. Yeah. And uh, Jesus doesn't give us that. He instead says, no, there's something, there's something greater than all that that you need to pay attention to. Right, which is this whole idea that in Jesus, we are transformed such that the how, the very spirit, the very um, relational practices and values that we bring into politics look very different than the divisiveness and the hatred consuming the world. Um, Russell, I want to ask you about uh, more, speak to more about pastors, uh, because again, as I've said, uh, we created this, this course for everyone, for all Christians, but we had a special heart for pastors, because uh, you're a former pastor, I'm a former pastor. Um, we know how hard it is and that politics particularly puts a squeeze on politics that if uh, pastors try to respond in the way that we're often tempted to respond, which is, well, I guess I gotta, I'm got i going to preach a great sermon on this on Sunday morning, that, that that's really a problematic play and that they actually need a different play. Say more about why the standard playbook of the Sunday morning sermon isn't a great play to run and why we're trying to offer a different way and what that, what that is. Well, I mean, for one reason, because you're too late <laughs> when it comes to uh, preaching a Sunday morning service on, on some of this, because... Um, I, I had a pastor say to me one time, I, you know, when I, I go on social media and I see what my people are saying and how they're saying it to each other, and I think, what have I been doing? Am, am I just a, a failure? And I had to say, no, you're not, you're not a failure at all. What you're dealing with is that you have all kinds of forces and voices out there surrounding all of us all the time. I mean, just think about how uh, how we are all changed by having this piece of glass in our pocket that can tell us anything all the time, and we can consume whatever sort of media we want. People are being inundated with that, but also because a lot of what you're seeing right now with the way that people interact with with one another, it's it's kind of the light from distant stars. So you're not able to kind of get people uh, completely transformed by the gospel in time for the end of 2024. What you are trying to do is to shape and form by the word of God, people's intuitions for 2034, where you have people who are the kind of people with the renewing of the mind are able to recognize ways that that lead to something other than Jesus and recognize ways that do bring about life and, and hope and peace and, and righteousness. And so it's a long-term thing and that can be really bewildering and, um, and demoralizing sometimes until we start to realize that's exactly how Jesus told us uh, this would come about. It's like yeast working its way through. It seems invisible but the work is being done. And yeah. so there, there are often a lot of people that, I learned this as a youth pastor, actually, when um, I can look back and see that a lot of the kids that I thought, they're not listening to anything. They're, they're not going to really um, amount to anything when it comes to following Christ, were the very ones who ended up being the, the godliest, most impressive uh, adults. And some of the people that I thought, oh, they're really keenly attentive, didn't. So we we all we don't see right away exactly what what the Word of God is doing. I really like you calling us back to that biblical metaphor of yeast, and I think that really captures our our strategy here with the after party. Is we're trying to figure out ways to work it in to the life of the church, and kind of our belief is that rather than preaching one big sermon on Sunday morning on politics that you know on Monday morning your inbox is going to be filled with people angry at you on the left or on the right, right? Um, we're offering an East-like strategy, which is encourage people to take the course, 
in their existing communities, in their existing small group communities. It could be Sunday school. It could be the, the weekly Bible study. It could be the men's prayer breakfast, the women's prayer breakfast. But in already communities where people are gathering face-to-face -face in conversation, and what the after party as a course does is it frames the, the conversation on politics centered on Jesus and then facilitates the conversation that they're having with each other so that you as a pastor aren't up there taking, trying to take a big swing and in, and in, in response, taking a lot of returning fire instead. You know, what all you need to do as pastors out there is to say, hey, think about, you know, suggest to a small group to take this course, to try it out better yet. My suggestion is you as a pastor is to gather some folks around you to start it out with. You take them through the course and let that be a way in which this leaven works its its way through the church. Um, Russell, I want to ask one last question to you before we turn it over to the to the open Q and A, which is, this is we've been working on this for almost two years. We've had a lot of hopes baked into uh, this work on the after party. What would you say is one particular hope that you're really holding on to? for the after party for what this could accomplish. I I have the hope that there are people who are ready to just give up on their neighbors, on themselves or on the possibility of having higher expectations than what we're seeing right now. Um that won't give up. That will um that will as the as the scripture uh, says strengthen the 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 knees and the arms that are hanging down right now in order to to actually follow Christ and so i think that when you have people who are able to sit with each other and say we might disagree on some political candidates or some political policies or we might not even know where we stand on some of those things but what we do know is the way that that Jesus told us to live out the Christ life, and we're going to do that here um, as well as uh, as well as everywhere else. Which means sometimes you're going to have people who have completely different policy outcomes, um, but they they actually have the same motivation as to as to what they're they're seeking to do and they're they're carrying that out in the same Christ-like way. I hope I I hope that the after party helps helps there. Well, I'm going to turn it over to some questions here. Um so one question here is from Jonathan who said, "Hey, I learned in seminary how to evangelize Muslims, atheists, even loosely cultural Christians, but what are the best resources for doing discipleship directed towards people who claim their they're following Christ, but really actually have fallen into idolatry. Now, my, I'll answer this first. I hope they use the after party. <laughs> this is exactly what we're trying to do. So I think this is one resource that we hope. But, but Russell, we're not, we have never claimed we're the only people <laughs> doing this work. What are other resources in addition to the after party that, that you would recommend? And, and you've got a great view on that from your perch on Christianity Today. Well, I think, I think part of it is you have to be aware of, of, um, where the particular vulnerability is for your people. And sometimes you have people where you will say uh, they've fallen over into idolatry of some kind or the other, not because they're trying to do that, but because they don't know what an alternative is. And I mean, often, if you think about it in our own lives, some of the, some of the bad choices that I know I've made are often because I think I didn't stop to say, oh, well, there actually is a different way to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so for some people, just having that modeled uh, for them is a is enough to consider and to change it. And so a lot of it, I mean, I, I honestly think a lot, there's a lot that people don't recognize of power in the example of pastors and lay people in congregations, there are people watching all the time. I mean, I, I can think of those people in my own life that really shaped me as a kid and as a teenager, because I was looking and saying, um, you know, wait, this is, this is the way they're responding to conflict, or this is the way they're responding to suffering. That, that just has a lot of power that I, I think we don't see. So, Russell, one of the things that, like as, as I've said, is crucial to the after party's message is we're trying to center people back on the how of politics 
versus the what, right? The what of what party or what candidate you should vote for. And yet, uh, I have a question from Cassie Wright here that I think points to that th they're, that pastors are under a lot of pressure, though, to actually stake out a position on the what, to endorse a candidate or to endorse a political party or, or policy. So Cassie writes, well, can you give us some practical or biblical advice on how to explain why I am not saying, that, you know, who, who they should vote for from the pulpit? Well, I think I think you explain what it is that you are here to do and that the the authority that Jesus actually has given you. So Jesus has given you the authority to explain his word, to lead people toward discipleship and conformity with him. He he didn't give you the authority to be a precinct captain. And so uh, to, to say to people, and I've often, I, I saw a pastor who modeled this really well, who said to some people in his congregation, you actually don't want me uh, to do what you think you want me to do. Because when you're on your deathbed, you don't want a political operative showing up there. <laughs> you're, you're going to want a pastor. And, and I think most people do. And if you, if you explain that and model it, some people... I mean, you're never going to please everybody, um, yeah. but there are going to be a lot of people who will recognize that. Yeah. We have a great question here from anonymous attendee. We see you, anonymous attendee. Um, and the question is this. How do we have better conversations with people who are into conspiracy theories? Because according to an anonymous attendee, there are a lot of them in our churches. Yeah, well, I think the, the first thing is don't fall into conspiracy theories yourself. Um, and so guard yourself from that and ask, why is it that that people move toward conspiracy theories? And there are a lot of reasons for that. One of those, one of those being that a, a good conspiracy theory works because it gives you a feeling of life. There's a jolt. Something is really, really important out there, and I'm at the center of it. Uh, and it gives you a sense of belonging. The people who are in the know know that this is uh, this is actually going on. And so it creates that false sense of life and belonging. And often the answer is not so much to tear that down as to replace it with something genuine. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a lot of times people with family members, for instance, who will say, my mom and dad have really gotten into conspiracy theories or my kids have, and I don't know, I don't know how to relate to them. And I think for a lot of people, the first impulse is to cut them off mm -hmm. and to say, uh, I'm just not going to talk to them anymore. I'm not going to go over there anymore. And that is almost always the wrong uh, choice to make because it makes the problem worse. I mean, one of the reasons people go for conspiracy theories is because they're lonely and they're disconnected. So they need more connection, not less. So a lot of times what needs to happen is, um, and I've seen this work for a lot of people, to say, you know, you and I disagree on whatever it is. But I really love you and I want to spend time with you. And can we do that and just sidestep this question for right now? Now, that doesn't mean the, the issue is not important and that it ought to be sidestepped by everybody. But it means that you're saying, okay, we're in a different kind of relationship here and it matters to me and I want to keep it. Yeah. And th that's usually the the advice I give to people. At least it, I love I love that. Address the underlying emotional, spiritual sort of hunger uh, mm -hmm. that's there, that the conspiracy theory is at best a a, a quick hit a quick hit drug trying to address that and try to get at it underneath it. That's a great piece of pastoral advice. Um, all right, so um, I have a question here from Edward Smith, which I found really interesting. Uh, Edward asked this, how do I, we address multiple generations that carry differing perspectives? Uh, and I think that speaks to that in a lot of churches, the political divides, uh, you know, are actually falling down on some generational lines as well. And so it's reinforcing uh, already, ex even already the existing divide of generations. How, how do we address this? Well, I think, I think we address it uh, for the body as a whole, 
in, in terms of a reorienting as to what are we actually here for? What, what, did, what did Jesus call us together for? But then we talk to the generations separately um, in terms of what that looks like for them. And I think that sometimes the problem is an overreaction to the last bad thing. And so there are times when we see something that we think this is bad. I recognize this is bad. And so the answer has to be the complete opposite. Mm. And that that is almost never the case. I mean, I, I quote constantly C.S. Lewis's advice the devil doesn't send errors into the world one by one, but two by two on either oh. side, of what's right. Yeah. And so if, if all I'm doing is trying to protect myself from whatever this is, yeah. uh, often I end up in a, in a very dangerous place. And generationally that can happen. You see that happen a lot in churches where an older generation uh, gives up on the younger generation and caricatures them and kind of cuts them off. Or a younger generation can say, because we saw the older generation doing these things, mm. we're going to prove we're not that by going to the other extreme. That just doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, Russell, we've been talking about how you know we have these profiles of the combatant, the cynic, and the exhausted, and how all three of us are trying to move towards disciple. Uh, so I have a question from Dave asking the obvious question. Well, what would that look like? What would a mature disciple look like in the political realm? And what practices would characterize the the training of people towards that disciple uh, posture? Well, fruit of the spirit uh, to to see people who are living out. I mean, we're always going to do that in a fallen and imperfect way, this side of uh, the new creation, but to to actually be self consciously thinking about it. And one of the things that that I've found with Christians, and one of the things that we tried to emphasize in the after party, is that often just recognizing the problem is the answer. Hmm. So when I start to say, "Okay, I think in this area of my life, I'm given over to cynicism." Mm -hmm. or I'm given over to despair, then that means I need to, to watch that and to bring that before the Lord in prayer and to spend time cultivating a different kind of, um, a different kind of being before God. And so that's what, it, that's what it looks like. And it looks like what we aspire to in all of our life, which is repentance and, and faith. So we fall down, we, we do things wrong, uh, all the time, we relate to one another in wrong ways, and we see it, and we say, "Lord, give me the grace to to alter that, to yeah. to change direction." I want to have another follow up question on this path towards disciple, which is the ways that we actually spend our time. And this is a question from another. I'm presuming these are different anonymous attendees. Um, and the question is this, given the reality that even devout believers consume more news than they, than they do scripture, how would you guide people in choosing the new media they should consume, you know, if they are trying to become more like disciples, other than advising them to read broadly? Um, in other words, without recommending specific sources, what guidance would you give to people since people are so distrustful of the press and institutions in general? Well, I think there are two parts to that. I mean, the, the part of it when it comes to consuming media, um, what I would say is go out of your way to, to consume multiple different platforms, often with different points of view. Because what you're going to see sometimes, it's not just that there's a different point of view, sometimes you're going to notice that there are things that aren't even talked about in one area that are talked about in another. And it's a, it's a good uh, question to ask, well, why is that? Um, that's one part of it. But the other part of it is there's a tendency sometimes to be consumed by the news. It, it starts with that very legitimate desire to be well-informed and good uh, citizens but it can easily tip over into doom scrolling. <laughs> and I think in, in that case, um, 
to say, I really have to set some parameters for distance. A, a friend of mine was saying today that he noticed that having um, X, the app previously known as Twitter, on his phone was causing him to check it all the time. Yeah. And he, he didn't want to give it up, but he just kept it on his laptop and not on his phone. Yeah. And he said that was that was enough to kind of wean me off of this constant sort of dopamine rush right. connection. I think well, actually, that's good. I want to ask you a specific question. This is from Curtis Chang now uh, as the, the question asker here, because I want to ask you how much for the average Christian would you say, how much news do you actually need to consume, like actually need to be informed because, and I'll, I'll give myself away here. I used to consume a lot more news and you would think that hosting a podcast, writing a book on politics, doing the after party, I should up my news consumption to stay more informed. I found I'm actually better if I lower my news consumption and actually read more history, more biography, more fiction, like read more broadly. I'm actually better at interpreting the little bits of news. And I don't actually need to keep track of every little bit that is swaying me this way and that way emotionally. What do you think about that, Russell? Absolutely. Because that kind of, the kind of um, deep attention reading that you're describing here is what cultivates the kind of imagination and intuition that can really interpret uh, what's going on in the news. So yeah, it's it's almost never my advice to someone, you really need to be more informed on what's happening in the news because you can have people who are just, you know, you're, you're just completely overwhelmed. We have access to um, everything immediately yeah. in the way that nobody in the history of the world ever has. But what we often don't have is the kind of wisdom to recognize what's going on there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what, I mean, think about discipleship. Think about uh, think about what Jesus is doing in the temptations in the desert when he's quoting back scripture, but he's quoting back scriptures that uh, that indicate, I know the context here. I know what you're doing because we've been here before. Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8. He he cites those passages of scripture and he was he was steeped in that. And and so are so should we be. And that helps yeah. us actually to be better um consumers of news. Yeah. Um I I I really encourage people <laughs> read old books in this mm -hmm. season. <laughs> read old books. Uh, because that will actually give you the proper perspective on how to make sense of this. And I, uh, these days I, I scan headlines. Uh, there might be a few pieces, a deep, really, you know, a really well-written, well-reported piece I might read, but I am no longer trying to stay abreast of every single issue on every single uh, topic. It's impossible. And it'll just take me down some, like you said, some doom scroll paths. Um, yeah. Russell, here's a very controversial question that apparently has been coming up a lot uh, in the, in the chat, which is, uh, it's a very, I'll summarize it. This is from uh, another anonymous attendee, but I'll try to summarize it here, which is we in our um, course, the after party, <clears throat> we do not say, tell people again, we're very clear. We're not telling you how to vote. We're not telling you uh, which party to, is the right Christian party. We think that way of thinking about politics is the wrong way. And yet, Russell, you and I and David have been very much on the record of like, we feel like there, we do have a take on the what. Um, and so how do you maintain this balance? Like, especially given that, you know, we believe that there, you know, there are certain candidates <laughs> that are very dangerous to the, to, to the church and to the Republic. And we've, we've been very clear in naming, naming that reality. Then Ooh. let's just name it. Now we, we think Trump has a particular danger to the Republic and to the, to the church. And yet we're also saying, hey, politics is more than the what, and it's about the how. So how do we maintain this balance, Russell? Well, I think one of the things that uh, I have noticed uh, over the past year or so is that I will be talking to very Trump-supportive uh, friends uh, who are growing just as exhausted or cynical or combative as yeah. as anyone else and who are recognizing that yeah and so are are able to to say okay let's just 
step aside from the the actual issue for a, a minute and say where does where does this kind of world come from and what is it doing to me yeah. so we're going to we're going to very um very clear uh, viewpoints of course this is i mean the donald trump as an issue uh my wife and i were talking about the other day has just gone into every area of life, yeah. every area of family, yeah. churches. And when we can't think of one area where this isn't the case, um, but it, it's kind of like when I'm sort of talking to people about anything else, marriage, parenting, so forth. There are a lot of things where I have really, really uh, strong views, but I also am able to say, even if you don't agree with me on that, Here's what the word of God says to all of us. Yeah. And so this matters to all of us. So I I would hope that after going through the after party, uh, somebody who completely disagrees with me on Donald Trump uh, will nonetheless be able to live out a life in 2024 that's seeking the kingdom first. So it's, right. a, it's an issue of priority, um, yeah. just like with anything else. Yeah. And, and the reality is, if you make Trump the center of your focus, either for or against, you're elevating Trump to the to a to a place that he doesn't belong into. It doesn't, and no, Biden doesn't. No, no political party deserves to be that place where they are the dominating, defining feature. And so what happens is if you elevate a political figure like Trump or or somebody else, Biden or whoever, that person ends up defining your values also. Like you start interpreting what it means to be a Christian through that person, either for or against. And what we're trying to do in after parties is let's recenter on Jesus and recenter on the values he teaches, and then let that use that to interpret various politics or politicians. So, in other words, for instance, we're not, we don't mention any political candidate in the course. We certainly don't mention Trump in the political course. We are calling people to is hope and humility. And we make the case that Jesus, the Jesus way, to use your phrase, the Jesus way is marked by hope and humility. We want to get people centered on hope and humility. Then we'll let people make their own decision. Once they're, they have elevated the Jesus call to hope and humility as the highest, then you make the call on which candidate more resembles hope and humility. And if you think that's Trump, okay, we'll, we, we'll we'll probably disagree on that, but at least we're in agreement on the central values that we ought to make these decisions by. Yeah. And, and what we're, what we're seeking to do here is yes, to, to help the church navigate through 2024, but uh, we're really looking at 2034 and 2040. Right, we're playing the long game here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that people, even even who will completely disagree and argue with each other uh, all over the place, are doing it in a different way than what we're seeing right now, yeah. with uh, the, the the kind of um, the kind of uh, rhetoric, the kind of mob, whether actual mobs or online mobs. Uh, happening. I mean, every, everyone, no matter where we are politically, ought to be able to see, okay, this isn't working for us. Yeah. This isn't working. So there has to be a better way. Yeah. All right. I have another question from David Sharp. He asked a really interesting uh, situation that he was in. I was recently asked to offer the prayer at our county's GOP prayer breakfast. Some people in our church are active in this group. I was leaning toward accepting then my conscience was pricked while reading Tim Alberta's latest book, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. I then declined out of concern about exacerbating the connection between our church and a political party. I wonder if I did it out of fear. On the other hand, I wonder if it is wisdom to avoid public connections that can be construed as a support of a party. That's a very practical situation here that I think a lot of pastors are being uh, confronted with. Give, give uh, David and others some advice here, Russell. Well, this is not thus saith the Lord. This is just thus thinketh more. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't do that uh, because it it would in most contexts seem as though you are um, endorsing one particular political party, whatever party that is, uh, in a way that can actually detract from your 
gospel authority so that when people, what's happening when a lot of people are looking at Jesus and they're looking at the Bible for the first time, a lot of, or uh, frankly, a lot of people who have been at it for a while are thinking, is it really about something else? Is it is it really about uh, some marketing ploy or some political uh, candidate or something like that? And so I would I would try to do everything to avoid that stumbling block. Now there have been ex- uh, uh, there have been uh, examples of people I think who have done that and done it well. I think of for instance Cardinal Dolan in New York, who uh, prayed at both the Republican and Democratic uh, national conventions. And it was really clear nobody's using his ministerial uh, credentials for their political campaign because he's just showing up and saying, okay, you need prayer, I'll pray for you. If that's the case, I think it can be done well. All right. I have a question from uh, David Jacobson. He says that in reading Tim Alberta's book, uh, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, and you're welcome, David, for that recommendation, uh, one takeaway from the early chapters is uh, Tim's argument that actually this didn't happen, this 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 sort of hijacking of evangelicalism didn't happen overnight, but it actually is the product of a long history of American evangelical uh, church history. And so with this in mind, Russell, position what we're trying to do in the light of this long game, this end of this long, long term dynamics that we're trying to address. Well, I think I think one of the things that we have seen lately is a heightening of uh, the way that we tend to secularize our own concepts. And that that that's what's in many cases the most alarming to me is we will use, for instance, the apocalyptic um concept of of scripture and misapply it to okay we're facing a catastrophe uh right now which means all the normal ethical and moral rules are suspended right or we use and this worries me even more we use the language of spiritual warfare but we use it um in the exact opposite way that the scripture does uh, we we wrestle with flesh and blood in, instead of with <laughs> yes. principalities and powers yeah. in the heavenly places. And that's really dangerous because our metaphors change us. Yeah. And if you if you use language intended for demons with human beings, demons are irredeemable. They, they, they are simply to be uh, defeated. Human beings are all made in the image of God and 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 ought to be ambassadors of reconciliation for all of them. Yeah. So those things, I think there are there are ways where even uh, those of us who've been the most worried about secularization, um, we, we haven't seen the way that secularization has happened uh, in all kinds of places that we didn't see it or recognize it. Yeah. Well, Russell, thank you so much. We've been putting you through the paces. You, you, we need to get to send you to uh, send you to bed or something. Uh, I'm not exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> you may cynically think so. <laughs> well, Russell, it is uh, always so fun to to do this with you, and uh, I hope all of you will check out the after party. The course we have a trailer that is will you'll be getting into your inbox that if you wanted to get a quick peek into it, just a few minutes, you can watch the trailer. Uh, but again, the afterparty.org, please consider taking it in your small groups, Inter- tell people about it in your church, in your Sunday school, in whatever small group setting you have. This is a great resource for you in 2024 to center on Jesus with our politics. Um, this course, just to remind you, is free. It is free. So there's no, uh, and it's uh, all will be free all the way through the 2024 election. Um, and that we, if you want to learn more about how to use the course or just want to dive more into these issues, uh, we will have actually two more webinars coming up. One with uh, me and David uh, French on February 12th, and then we're bringing Russell back on March 8th. And then the details and the registrations are included on the afterparty.org website. And just as a little teaser, as a little teaser, uh, if you are in the D.C. area, the what is the the phrase they use? The DMV, right? Um, 
in April, on April 19th, we are planning a big party, a big event for all around the after party. So be on the lookout for that. Um, thank you, Russell. Thank, Thank you, you, participants. Curtis. Yeah, Anytime. you're welcome. And everybody, for all of you who are who have been uh, participating, it was a thank you for your great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but come think about coming back to our future webinars, and we will work hard to get to your questions. And in the meantime, uh, God bless you all, and come back soon again when we'll gather around the campfire once again. Take care. <laughs>